So hello everyone and welcome to my talk about the just-in-time compilers in the OpenJDK. I'm Martin Durr and I work for SAP. We are a small team um, working on the JVM at SAP in Waldorf. And uh, this time we have uh, three, time, three talks in a row. So we will also see two of my colleagues later on. But let's get started with, with the agenda. So I will talk about the just-in-time compilers which translates Java bytecode into machine code in the OpenJDK. I will also talk about how different compilers work together. And I also li I'd like to address resource usage as well. So first of all, how many compilers do we have in the OpenJDK? We've already heard about two ones, but how many do we have? We have one more. Three ones. So. Um, the one we haven't heard today yet is the client compiler, which is also called C1. It compiles pretty quickly, but with a lower optimization level. And then we have the server compiler, also called C2. We already had a talk about that one. It's kind of the opposite. It uh, compiles slowly, but therefore with a high optimization level. For example, it has a lot of loop optimizations. And uh, we've also heard about the escape analysis. And there are still people on Im working on improvements for that. Both compilers are available on a lot of platforms, including PowerPC and S390, which are supported by our team. And these two compilers are used by default. And we've also heard about Graal, which is rather new in the OpenJDK. It is still experimental in the OpenJDK. That means it is not used by default. You need to switch it on if you want to use it. And it is developed on GitHub. So updates get merged into the OpenJDK. Um, special to Graal is that it is written in Java. That is a big difference to the other two compilers. And uh, it also does a lot of optimization. It has a more sophisticated escape analysis, for example. Andrew has already shown a few things about Graal. So thanks for that. Um, and this, it is optimized for dynamic languages. By the way, Graal compiler is also called Graal VM compiler. And I'd like to show a few things uh, Andrew has already mentioned. I got one slide from Oracle. So thanks to Oracle for providing it. Um, there are three different use cases of Graal VM. And, uh, the Graal compiler is always in the center of it, together with the JVMCI, the Java Virtual Machine Compiler Interface. And uh, the use case on the very left is the one which is available in the OpenJDK. So you have a Java application um, or Java methods which get compiled by Graal, and uh, they run on the hotspot VM, the Java Virtual Machine of the OpenJDK. So that path on the very left is supported by the OpenJDK. Um, and in addition to that, on the right-hand side, you can see the native image technology, Andrew also already mentioned. Um, and everything gets compiled, pre-compiled. Um, and there's something in between where only the Graal compiler is pre-compiled into a shared library. So that's the basic difference between this approach and this one. Your Graal compiler itself is pre-compiled in a shared library. So back to the different compilers. I'd like to compare performance a little bit. Uh, by the way, this is an old benchmark with an old JDK and an old garbage collector. But don't care about numbers. It's, I think it's good to get an, a, a first impression about the performance of the different compilers. So at, at the bottom, you can see interpreter for, uh, for reference. So that means we are not using any just-in-time compiler. And you can get that by uh, specifying the runtime option minus x int. That stands for interpreter mode. So you will, all, uh, you will only uh, use the interpreter, no, compile, no JIT compilers at all. And as you can see, the performance is pretty poor. Um, already much faster is, is the C1, the client compiler. You can select that, for example, by using this flag, tiered stop at level 3. 
Um, that might sound a little bit complicated, um, and I have to have to note that um, level three means that C1 still performs profiling, so um, you won't get the best performance out of C1 by that. If you want to tune C1, you would uh, select stop at level one, and then you would get C1 without profiling. Um, but in this case, I, w I want better profiling information. That's why I, I left it on. Um, if you want to use the C2 compiler only, you can switch off tiered compilation. Um, and then you get the blue line, which is already much faster. Um, and the default configuration uses tiered compilation. And you get the fastest startup and the best peak performance. The best peak performance also because uh, the profiling information is better. But I'll, I'll explain the tiered compilation stuff later on more in more detail. So you should be able to understand it better at the end. But for those who hate this old stuff, I have al also a slide with the latest JDK. So the same old benchmark with the latest JDK 15. And you can already see that the peak performance is better with C2 especially. Um, and you can also see the green line, which is new. That is Graal. Um, in order to use Graal, you need to use this switch, use JVMCI compiler, which is an experimental option. So you need to unlock it in addition. And uh, Graal is the default JVMCI compiler. So you will get, so we, you will get Graal by this flag. So performance, peak performance of Graal is good. Um, even for this very traditional workload, Graal performance is, uh, of course, better for more uh, modern workloads. For example, if you run Scala, that's what Twitter does a lot. Um, and uh, I should also mention that the OpenJDK only contains the uh, community edition of Graal. There's also an enterprise, uh, an enterprise version available, which contains more optimizations. So you will get better performance with the enterprise edition. Um, and you can also see that the startup uh, takes longer. You, it takes a couple of seconds until here 4.5 seconds, roughly, to get peak performance. And that's due to the fact that Graal itself is written in Java. So the Graal compiler itself gets interpreted at the beginning. And then later on, hot methods gets, get compiled by C1. And later on, they get compiled by which compiler? <coughs> The Graal compiler itself, so Graal compiles itself, and that takes a few seconds. So this may be okay for large server applications where you can afford spending a few seconds, but there's also an, a possibility to fix that if you need a quicker startup, and uh, that's uh, available with the, with Graal VM. So the Tray VM um, has a feature called print flex final. And if you enable that, you will see all flag configurations the VM sets for itself. And you can also find, uh, use JVMCI native library, use nat JVMCI native library. And with Graal VM, that one is true by default. And that means the JVM is using the pre-compiled shared library. So the Graal compiler is already pre-compiled. And you get a pretty good startup with that. So next, I've promised to explain tiered compilation a little bit. So tiered compilation is basically the answer to the question of uh, how these different compilers work together. As already mentioned at the beginning, everything is, uh, starts at the interpreter, which is tier 0. And then we have three different tiers for the C1 compiler. Tier 1 is uh, C1 without any profiling. That is used only for trivial methods. When the C1 believes that it's not worth optimizing further, so we will stick on, on this trivial compilation. Um, and then there's tier, tier 2. C1 uses reduced profiling. And it does that when it thinks there's too much work to do. So we just should make it quick. And the default uh, tier for C1 is tier 3. And you get the full profiling code 
compiled into the compiled method. And then finally, the tier 4 is for the highest optimi optimization level. And it uses C2 compiler in, uh, by default in OpenJDK. And you can replace it by Graal if you enable it explicitly. You can also see the, the tiers when you enable print compilation. You can see which method gets compiled at which tier. And uh, typically, most methods get start, started at tier 3. Then you get also tier 4 method compiled by, by C2 in this case. But uh, here's also a picture to explain that a little bit more in detail. Everything starts in the interpreter, as already mentioned at the beginning. And the interpreter performs invocation counting. And once the invocation count of a method reaches a certain level, then a, a compile task gets generated in the C1 compile queue. A C1 compiler thread can pick it up and create a C1 compiled method, which is a tier 3 method in this example. And as already mentioned, uh, tier 3 also does profiling, which includes invocation counting. So this compiled code still does invocation counting. And once a compiled method reaches, or a method reaches this level, then a, a compile task gets uh, generated in the C2 compile queue. And similar to, uh, to C1, a C2 compiler thread can pick it up and create the fastest uh, version of the method. And uh, this is how, uh, how it works for method invocations. Um, but there may be long running loops uh, which without any method invocations. And obviously, um, the invocation counting will not help in that case. That's why there's also back edge counting, which works similar. So it's almost the same slide. But here with back edge counters, in, um, instead of uh, the invocation counters with different limits. Um, and what happens here, we, um, the compilers generate so-called OSR methods, <coughs> which stands, stands for on-stack replacement. And um, the, 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 they are special methods. They have an entry point for the loop. Um, and uh, on-stack replacement is called this way because um, an interpreted method gets removed from the stack frame, and it gets replaced by a compiled uh, stack frame. That's why we call it on-stack replacement. So I've already talked about uh, compiler threads. How many compiler threads are we using? Well, that depends on, uh, on the machine we are running on. In the office, I have a 40 CPU Linux machine. And when using printflex final, I can see that the VM selects CI compiler count to 15. That is computed by a fancy formula. And um, it, um, it, uh, one third of them are reserved for C1. And the remaining 10, in this case, are reserved for T, uh, C2 threads. And similar um, to compiler threads, the, G, the VM also decides on how many GC threads to use, which is 28 on my machine. And obviously, these numbers are pretty high for simple workloads. When you just do trivial things with your JVM, you don't need so many threads. We already heard this morning that threads are expensive. So we usually don't want that. And uh, that's why we have implemented a new feature that was contributed by us. It's called dynamic number of compiler threads. We already shipped it with JDK 11. So it's not brand new, but it, it's the first time it is uh, shown at a conference, I believe. Um, and what we do um, by this new feature, um, we interpret these numbers as uh, maximum numbers. So we start up to 15 compiler threads. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to, to that later, but uh, we start one one thread of each type uh, at startup and uh, additional threads only on demand. And there's a similar feature called dynamic number of G GC threads, which was already implemented by Oracle. We just switched, switched it on by default with JDK 11. 
and with that you get um, of course much much lower resource usage um, it's still possible to switch these features off to get to get the old behavior so all compiler and GC threads get started um, at the VM startup um, I have tuned all the memory settings to very low sizes so the JVM should actually uh, not use a lot of memory but you can see virtual memory is pretty high here and uh, that's uh, because of, of the threads uh, they reserve a lot of, of virtual memory or they occupy virtual memory on, on Linux due to the glibc and um, we, and if you don't switch off these new features, you can see we get a much lower virtual memory usage. It's from 6 gigabyte to 1.5 down. Yeah, but it's not about not only about um, not only about virtual memory. We of course uh, also save other resources. But you can trace um, compiler threads also by this flag. It's a di diagnostic flag, so you need, need to switch it on to enable, to unlock these options. And uh, as already mentioned, you can see that the JVM starts initially one, com one compiler thread of each type, so which is 1C2 and 1C1 thread, and they get kept alive for the whole lifetime of the JVM. And uh, the other threads only get added on demand that depends on the compile queue length and also on the available memory and uh, code cache space which is available because we don't want to mess up things when the memory is already full we don't want to start any any further threads um, and once they these compiler uh, compiler threads don't have any work left to do they will die after some time and they die in the reverse order they were generated, so we don't have any gaps in the compiler list. So that's the feature we are already using. And uh, one, one remark on the memory usage of, of the compilers. Um, C1 and C2 compilers, of course, use native memory. And in comparison to that, the Graal compiler uses Java heap. So that may be an issue because your <coughs> Java application uses the same heap and you may need to to select to configure a larger heap with the uh, XMX flag. Otherwise you may get out of memory issues. Um, and it is also solved by um, using this shared library because that uses an and a separate heap, which is part of the native image technology, so it's not it doesn't use the the regular Java heap which you want to use for your application. So that's all already it. What I wanted to tell, maybe a, a few remarks. It is also possible to configure the compiler threads to to use lower memory. For example, you can tune inlining. Um, but of course that may have performance implications and it is also possible to uh, set a node limit for the C1 compiler that will make it smaller or will limit the, the memory it uses but of course that has always side effects so I wouldn't re recommend that in general so I, I'm sure we have time for questions left excellent any questions? We need a microphone. Oh. Oh, it's still here. Uh, I was just wondering what the, uh, the compiler thread count and heap size, or virtual memory size, or whatever sizes look like when you force uh, tier one, when you only run with C1. Is it, it, I would assume it's fewer threads and, and less heat, but I don't, you didn't cover that. Um, the, the virtual memory issue is, is due to, to the malloc arenas from glibc, um, and the first allocation already uh, occupies a tw uh, 128 megabyte block of, of heap, uh, 
is not really used, it's only virtual memory, so in most cases it's not really a problem. Um, but that is uh, independent of which compiler it is or which thread it is. It also happens with Java uh, threads or with any other thread. Um, and there's also an, another uh, way to fix that. You can configure the glibc um, to use low, uh, less uh, malloc arenas. There's a malloc arena max um, environment variable, and you can limit the memory by, by using that. That, they, that may have impacts on, on other performance things um, because if you have many native threads which uh, perform a lot of uh, concurrent mallocs, you may get issues with that. But for the JVM itself, it, it works pretty well. We have tried that. We have um, experimented with using only one malloc arena and the JVM itself uh, still works quite okay because it has its own memory management and we are not so not so much using many concurrent mallocs, small, <coughs> small concurrent mallocs. Good question, actually. Thanks. <coughs> Further questions? So I have a question. Um, for, the, for the server compiler and the client compiler, um, the code cache is managed by the sweeper. Is the same mechanism Im, uh, implemented for the Graal VM? Um, the sweeper has a, different, has a separate thread, so it's no longer a part of the compiler threads. So I'm not aware of any relationship between Graal, Graal compiler and, and the sweeper. Maybe Andrew has, has a few thoughts about that. Um, the objects will get dropped. Um, I don't know how the memory gets reclaimed. I, I think the, the, code, the code of memory must be... Um, no, I'm not sure. Okay. So, no. So, so, so the short answer is... I'm not absolutely yeah. sure about that. Um, so okay. I, I, I wouldn't want to say unless I could be sure. But I do know that the, 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 there's, there's external... Uh, there's, there's a change made to like external uh, code segments, not in the in, in, in original code cache. And they're wrapped with a, a stub that points to them. So Graal mm -hmm. is managing some of its own memory, I think, and I'm not sure how that gets reclaimed. But mm -hmm. Graal does know about deoptimization events. It maybe also is a way that it can find out about the fact that something is... Is, has been uh, released, and there's a release protocol. I just don't know for sure. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm not a, not really a Graal expert. I, I've worked a lot on C1 and C2, but not so much on Graal. So. But related to the code cache, uh, um, there was a significant change back in the past. We only had uh, the sweeper run by by the the uh, compiler threads, and in the meantime, we have a dedicated sweeper thread. More questions? So I think we're done. Yeah. Thanks everyone for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>